Bluegrass Jamalong is proud to be sponsored by Collins Guitars and Mandolins, each and every one built from the sound up in Austin, Texas. This episode is also brought to you by Peghead Nation, the home of Roots Music Instruction. If you want to improve your playing, join me and thousands of other pickers getting better every day at pegheadnation.com. Hi, this is Matt, and you're listening to Bluegrass Jam Along, the podcast for anyone and everyone who loves bluegrass. My guest this week on Bluegrass Jam Along is Rebecca Frazier. Um, Rebecca was the first woman ever to appear on the cover of Flat Picking Guitar Magazine, and with her band Hit and Run, was the only band to win all three Rocky Grass, Telluride, and Spigma Festival band competitions. Um, but Rebecca is here today to talk about a fantastic new record she's got coming out in September on Compass Records called Boarding Windows in Paradise. Rebecca, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, let's just start by saying congratulations on a great record. I'm really enjoying it. Thank you very much. It's been a labor of love for sure. Yeah, and maybe that's an interesting place to start because it's been it's been a while since the last record, um, and that that itself took a while. It's been, if I understand it right, it's sort of the last record when we fall was the first time you'd really focused on writing the bulk of the material yourself, and that's right. definitely the heart of this record as well. Um, and so, was it kind of a combination of? just other things getting in the way or taking your time to get the songs right or just a little bit of everything? And all of the above. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, thank you for, for getting that because I, I think, you know, after putting out a big project like that and touring and having three pregnancies kind of almost back to back, I was a bit overwhelmed and took a step back, wanted to have something nice, great to say that I was really excited about. And, um, And then along the way became a single parent Um, shortly, you know, after the touring cycle for When We Fall. And that was brand new for me, Um, just writing either by myself or with co-writers who weren't the person I was married to Um, on When We Fall. I did a combination of my own songs, my own material and some that we had co-written together. So this was um, an adventure for me doing the Nashville you know, sitting down, spending all day with another writer and taking some real time to edit and to just be super excited about the songs we were going to do. And, um, and once I knew I had enough material that I was super excited about, in fact, I actually had way too much material by (laughs) then. (laughs) I started reaching out and kind of spending a lot of time figuring out who the best producer would be. And it just turned out to be an old friend, Bill Wolf, who I who had been mastering all my projects since um, since the hit and run days, since two thousand three. So that was amazing that he was willing. He hadn't recorded an album, you know, since in a really long time as a mm. producer and engineer. He'd been focusing mostly on mastering. And so, he's he's had his hands on some of the records that people listening to this podcast will know and love very well. Right, I'd say Manzanita might be the the biggest one for bluegrass or so, Oh, Bill Wolf mm. did that. And then the list goes on, um, you know, from there, it's most, uh, most of Tony Rice's albums. Cause he toured, he was Tony's best friend. They lived together. They toured together. He was his sound engineer, uh, before he moved on to doing sound at the Birch mirror in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and then he started his own mastering studio, but he also is known for doing a lot of work with the grateful dead and a lot of other, um, wonderful artists, um, David Grisman and, um, Skaggs and Rice, he actually recorded, but he refused to take recording credit. So his name's not even on there, which I tease him about. (laughs) And it had to do with, it It was just, there was some reason he didn't want his name on there, but he's just, he's an amazing, amazing person. He's a a genius and he's so much fun and he's so good at both artistic um, vision and technical vision. So he's kind of, 
for me, he's a Renaissance man. I mean, he's just, he'll read physics books on a Saturday night for fun. You know, he's just, he's amazing. It sounds from the notes that came with the record that um, it, it was like a kind of quite an old school production process as well. It wasn't just in the studio. It sort of started before that and sort of talking about who to get in and how to do it. And Right. We met up one Easter. I was in Virginia visiting family. So I hopped on a train and he picked me up and he, he was the man in black. Actually, it, it was the first time I'd ever met him in person because we'd worked I'd send him my albums. He would master them. He would FedEx them back before internet was a way to do that. Um, so at meeting him that day, I was a little nervous. You know, he is a legend. Um, he asked me to play a little guitar, played for him, and then he made some coffee. And we sat in his backyard, and he, he kind of had this pensive look, and he was like, yeah, if we do this, I'd like to bring in, you know, people from, from my Tony days, probably, probably called Bela, Sam. And I started out <laughs> like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And, um, he was like, what? And I was like, that's too much. You know, I don't, I'm not really at that, at that, I'm not sure. And, um, he was like, no, it's about you and it's about the songs. It's not going to be about them. You'll see. But if you really want that sound, because I, I told him some of my favorite records of all time. And one of them that still holds up for me today is um, Dolly Parton, The Grass is Blue. Oh, I love that record so much. Just love it. It never gets old for me. And of course, the Tony records, but just that big, that big sound of The Grass is Blue. And it's very, it's, it's very late 90s. It has a lot of reverb. So it's a production wise, it's a little different. But what he was hearing and relaying to me is you want musicianship of this caliber. You, why not? And I was like, I, don't, I was a little intimidated. I walked away from that. And by the way, I found his Grateful Dead platinum record um, on the floor. And I asked if I could have it because it seemed like it was like <laughs> junk to him. And he was like, eh, okay, sure. Yeah, you can have that. I still have it on my piano. Wow. I don't, there it is. Yeah. Um, but, I went home and thought about it and kind of was too intimidated and then kind of got started um, thinking about some other ideas. And then I ended up just doing a 180 around Christmas time that year. I was like, you know what? I'm going to call him up. I called him up. I didn't have the kids. I said, can I come see you on New Year's Eve and let, let's, let's do this and I'll bring some demos. And he was like, yeah, I'm not doing anything. So we, celebrated new year's eve together and then we just sat there late into the night listening to my demos and me bringing up songs and making a plan and it was super exciting um so that you know it just he called the people just like he envisioned and they said yes and we organized the sessions and and i was floored you know it it, it happened it's really funny um like hearing you talk about that because like, when I first listened to the record, the first track, High Country Road Trips, got a similar sort of, they're not the same at all, but the, the Dolly record starts with Travelling Prayer. And there's just a sort of motoring, like we're off, like we're straight in, we are off, like we will slow down in a bit, but not now. And it's got that similar sort of, the energy just lands on you and goes, right, here we go, buckle up. And I love it. It's such a dynamic opening to the record. And like I hadn't even sort of considered there would be that connection, you know, but it makes... You know, like that's now a connection in my head in terms of the energy levels when I listen to it. That's interesting. And yeah, and, and when I listen to it, I straight up hear the influence because uh, there's the train song. She's got a train song. You know, I wrote a train song partially inspired by that. Um, my song Available is very bouncy. And I was really, I, the rhythm section to me was so key for that. Like I wanted it overly bouncy i wanted it to the point where you're just toe tapping and it feels that way to me you know i was proud of that whenever somebody would get a little too gentle for me in the studio i would speak up i'm like no bluesy and bouncy and that was bill and i share a lot of that um kind of that need for not being too gentle with bluegrass i just love a hard driving rhythm section I love a deep pocket. I love, I guess, 
for lack of a better word, kind of a testosterone sound in bluegrass. Yeah. I don't really do gentle very much or very well. I'd like to. I mean, I'd like to chill out a little bit, but I just, it's part of what attracts me to the music. It's just high energy and, you know. Yeah, fun. totally. So, kind of, you had demos at that point and so what what came together first in terms of, I'm really interested in how this record was arranged like whether that happened before the studio in the studio a combination of the two because one of the things I love about it most is how crafted these tracks are like they're great songs and they're beautifully played but there's also a real attention to detail in terms of just slipping in an extra bit or taking a little different harmony somewhere or just that you don't you're not just presented with a song that goes a b a b a b see you later there's always something new just slipping in your ear and like a, there's a lot of detail in there and I love that about it. We'll be right back with you just after this. Collings Guitars has been a long-time supporter of the bluegrass community from collaborating with artists to sponsoring festivals big and small and now by sponsoring Bluegrass Jam Along. Handmade in Austin, Texas, every Collings guitar and mandolin that leaves the shop is built from the sound up, and the team loves seeing a Collings in the hands of players of all levels, from local musicians to world-renowned pickers. Visit collingsguitars.com for more. This episode is also brought to you by Peghead Nation, the home of Roots Music Instruction. With 65 streaming video courses for guitar, mandolin, banjo, fiddle, dobro, bass and ukulele from some of the leading names in acoustic music, Peghead Nation is something for every picker. You'll learn the tunes and techniques you need to join in at jams and play the music you love, plus advanced techniques like improvisation, theory and ear training. Your first course is just $20 per month and you can add more for $10 a month. Sign up for any course and get your first month free with the promo code JAMALONG, all one word. Join thousands of other players, including me, who are advancing on their instruments and having more fun playing the roots music they love at pegheadnation.com. I appreciate that. Um, I take a lot of joy in that, and I think Bill does too. Um, Both of us are easily bored by um, listening, so we want to be constantly surprised. Um, if it's too surprising, there's, there's almost like a 50, 50 thing. If it's too surprising, it doesn't feel like a form. Um, seasons is a weird example. It changes almost every, I mean, it's called season, you know, seasons change is the point, but I I don't know if I played any of the verses with the same form that Mm. whole time. That was me. I did the reharmonization before I even showed up and I only played through seasons one time in the studio. Um, but that that was an anomaly because a lot of them Bill um, would listen to my form. For example, the guitar tune "Can't He Reel." Maybe that's an example for you. It's like you play the A, um, you know, A A B. I think it's A B C form, and then you know he he was like, "Let's do a little variation on this," you know, at the end of the banjo solo. And then I'm like, "Well, what if we add a six minor section?" So then we go to a little minor section. And then, of course, I wanted my long flat picking solo. and But then at the end, there's like anticipations and there's a quick switch to the six minor halfway through the A part. And it's just that kind of fun, fun arrangement style where it's, it is the form, but why not show off some fun arrangement skills too? And actually the band loves doing that too, because they don't want to be bored. Yeah, yeah. Like when we do it live. Well, and it's it's really interesting because you like you say about form and you know the kind of the point of form in music is to present you with some stuff that you know and then to add a bit of tension by adding in some stuff that you haven't heard yet and it's I love that I like records to do that um, and that was one of the examples in Canty Real is just little bits where you go hang on that's not how the B section finished last time they played it was you know <laughs> yeah it's great it's yeah it's it's lovely to hear all that um, and there's that. That's sort of there's something you, that you wrote about high country road trip about the charts looking like a mess, um, and we were percolating with ideas. And even though I'm guessing we overwhelmed them, they interpreted all ideas and added their own creativity, like the A game professionals they are. And it's such a like the banjo on that track for starters is just like off the charts. Like it's like you'd say it's got huge drive and pocket, but there's so much going on like dragging you across the bar lines and messing with the rhythm. Mm-hmm. and Yes. Okay. So that track, 
<laughs> Bill and I, I am scared to admit this. Bill and I spent a ton of time preparing for that session, like more than I've ever spent arranging. I had this idea as I was jogging one day, and I was, I heard eighties hooks. Like I heard hooks in my head. Did you, I don't know if you noticed, but it kicks off with two interwoven, like, there's a counterpoint with two hooks going on. Hmm. Like the banjo and the bass are going, do, do, do. They start with, do, 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 ba, da, 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 da. And then fiddle, guitar, and dobra are going, da, 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 da. And so it starts with that kind of groove and then everybody's playing and what kind of feels later you realize it's halftime, but at first it just kind of sounds almost like a pop groove. Like, dun, 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 dun. And then I like everybody playing it live tries to swing into bluegrass a little bit too early. And I was like, no, 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 we have to wait till basically the end of that first banjo solo before we even hint at playing bluegrass. Cause it's really building the tension of that low key mountain drive before you're kind of climbing up. And then that huge climax on top of the mountain. And, um, and Bill and I, as we created it, and it just took us forever. We were sitting there on the phone, like singing voice memos back and forth. And, um, he lives in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and meantime, both of us were hearing pop tunes, um, you know, he exercises, he would exercise on the treadmill and be like, Oh, I heard this tune the other day. It gave me the idea for this groove. And I was like, well, I heard this arrangement idea. So we were inspired and influenced by some like pop we were listening to knowing we wanted to bring it to bluegrass midway through, but then back to that other groove like we do at the end. So all of this is in a very haphazard way written out on a chart for these guys in a very unprofessional way I would say like they get this chart and they're looking at it like oh my god it's just like it looked so ridiculous it was embarrassing I will say it's embarrassing luckily I had recorded a demo of myself doing the guitar track to which they could you know refer to and know what was going to happen um so Barry Bales the bass player was um he was about to, I think he was about to hop on the tour bus to play a show with Alice and Krauss. And he literally only had time to do one or two takes. Mm. And that later he emailed me. He's like, I'm so sorry. Let me know if you need me to redo that. And we were, I was like, no, we got it. You know, we were able to, to use what he did. Um, but that was, I, I'm actually, I'm sorry to, yeah, I hope I'm not talking too long about this uh, i'm actually really proud of that arrangement effort it it was really fun and it was very creative it wasn't run of the mill it wasn't an everyday arrangement process for me it's it's got a wonderful balance like you were talking before about um, you if you have too many new things you lose form like it's got it's incredibly complex but it sounds um spontaneous it sounds fresh it doesn't sound like it's being labored through. Do you know what I mean? It sounds totally new. Right. Well, there's a lot of climbing and climaxing and coming down. And that was our, cause I was envisioning if you've ever been f between Denver and say Durango, there's highway 285 and there's this Vista and I captured it in the video, which is coming out um, tomorrow on blue bluegrass today is going to premiere it. Um, the video was out in Colorado and I made sure to head out to 285 and get that Vista when you're, you know, descending down into towards Buena Vista. And then you can actually, you know, you can go toward the great divide or you can go South towards Santa Fe. Um, and I just, I, that feeling was really important to me. That feeling of I'm in this moment here right now. I know I could go either way, but here I am. Let me just, savor this you know i think i wrote about not necessarily even trying to have a specific outcome with the feeling just let me savor this and i think it's something that we all wish we could feel all the time i mean it's, sometimes we have to buckle down and make decisions and do things that aren't you know feeling transcendent and elevated but i just wanted that to be expressed
And that's interesting because one of the things that I, as I was listening to the record, like the strongest theme that comes out of it to me is an, is explorations of different ideas of being in the moment or not. Like the idea of time and how you occupy time and how time changes and you do or you don't or whether you're in it or not. Like That, that seems to run through pretty much every song on the record in some form. Right. Like with seasons, um, it, it's been a big deal for me because I've had to make so many life changes, you know, going from being full-time bluegrass musician on the road to suddenly now, how do I play bluegrass and have little tiny kids? And then it seemed like every time I was figuring something out, everything was busting open, you know, cause then, you know, I got divorced and then that bust everything open. And it's like, Oh, I need to refigure this out. And then your children get older and you're dealing, you know, now my children are 12 and 15. So I'm dealing with little adults who know more than I do, hmm. quote unquote. Um, and I, I feel like at every phase, my constant is learning how to breathe, learning how to enjoy warming up on guitar. That's a big one for me. And because I've been filling this in between time between albums with um, a lot of coaching and teaching, I realize that's the biggest thing missing for um, my students. And, and I, I have evolved to where even just touching the guitar makes my body feel so relaxed and like I'm melting because I've I almost trained myself to enjoy the moment with it. And so that, that could be the reason the songs seem formulated in that way, you know? Yeah. There's just so many themes. Um, like make hay while the moon shines like hurricanes has got a big thread of that running through it and like train is moving and like this this idea of you know a, the, a train moving um and what, what you write about that it's about how time keeps progressing whether we jump on or not and the idea of seasons changing whether we change because it's that funny thing that you we, you're not always aware when you're in your life exactly which phase of your life you're in until afterwards and change you don't always process change as it happens or sometimes you think things have changed and it's it's i think there's such deep kind of themes to think about in so many ways just from are you in this moment now or not through to much bigger spans of stuff and it's 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 a lovely line through the record for me that's nice um that's nice to hear that that came across um the the boarding windows in paradise that line it's the last line of the record um we just keep on living here, boarding windows every year in paradise. When I wrote that line, I was, <laughs> Rory and I were writing together, who co-wrote High Country Road Trip, Rory Carroll. And she sat there with me all day because hurricanes had been in consideration for when we fall. And I'd co-written that with, with John, my ex-husband, when we were married. And I, I asked the producer, Brent Truitt, why he didn't want to record it. Um, and I was fine with it, but I was just curious. And he was like, well, it doesn't seem to mean much to me. It's some people along the coast in some hurricanes. This was before there was a chorus. And I just loved the melody. And after When We Fall album cycle, I called Rory and I was like, I love this song, but it's missing something. And I see it now. It doesn't really mean anything. It's just people who live on the coast, but there's hurricanes every year. And when she came, when we spent all day, probably 10 hours, just going back and forth with ideas, going back and forth. And then finally came up with this chorus. Uh, we were made to handle this. What is broken can be fixed. If it's worth the love it gives, we'll care for it. And it was like, okay, now... Now the metaphor that I thought was obvious with these people who live along the coast and even though their homes and beaches are destroyed every year, they rebuild it and just keep staying there. Like, why do they do all that work? Well, it's a passion project and, and they love it. But let's apply that to friendships, parenting, marriage, basically anything, playing music. You know, we, we were made to handle this. What is broken can be fixed. If it's worth the love it gives, we'll care for it. We'll actually put in the effort. 
My and my kids love to say that when I ask them, like when they aren't working at something or doing something, or if they haven't done something I asked, I'm like, why didn't you do that? They're like, I don't care enough. And I was like, oh, it really, it made me start realizing what people spend their attention on. Like it shows what people care about, what they'll spend their attention on, you know? Yeah. Essentially like what we spend our attention on is who we are. Like that, that's it really, isn't it? Right. It's like where you choose to give your attention is, is you. Right. It's like, it's like Dickens. It's like Scrooge spent his time on money. That's like all he cared about. And then like the world opened up when he realized like, oh, I can spend my time on money, but I can also spend it on these other areas that will provide more joy, you know? And there's something sort of um, implicit in that idea in, in that metaphor in Hurricanes about um, countering the notion that paradise is just something you wander into and then just hang out. Like, this idea that anything that is that is worthwhile requires some maintenance and some time. And it's one of the themes that really came out of doing these interviews over the last two or three years was this idea. It's very easy for me to see like high level musicians as having arrived and they're all just wandering around kind of going, oh, isn't it marvelous? Look at the views and it's beautiful. And like not a single one of them has that experience because they're all like boarding the windows and seeing what's happening next and, you know, fixing the things that they can see that are broken. And, um, like there aren't really those points of you don't just sit and look at the sunset indefinitely and go, isn't it beautiful? Because things move and things change and we change and the sun sets and, you know, I think there's a really lovely kind of depth to that in hurricanes. It's the idea that you do have to work on stuff and all the stuff in life that is worth having is fits into that camp, as you say. Yeah. I mean, that was that metaphor it, it was funny. It was like, this metaphor means a lot to me to the point where if no one else gets it, that's fine. But I just love this metaphor so much because paradise, it's just a paradox. That line is such a paradox to me. If it's paradise, why are you boarding windows? The whole point is like you just said, it's supposed to be perfect, right? So it's not i mean it it's perfect in it's what you make it like paradise is right here you know we we're living it every day if we make it so you know it's not elsewhere yeah i think there's a definite danger in life of always deferring happiness to some future time or some other place like rather than looking for it here or another dimension yeah yeah totally <laughs> um I wanted to ask you, there's a couple of songs on here I wanted to particularly ask you about that are covers. And one of them is a Roy Orbison cover, It's Over, which you said you'd been sitting on for 20 years. And <laughs> yeah. I love the idea of that. Um, but it's it's sort of, because Roy Orbison songs tend to be fairly kind of wide ranging and dramatic in terms of vocal kind of range and delivery. And, and bluegrass is often quite a non-dramatic vocal delivery kind of, music and I love how you kind of straddle a line between the two of it being authentic and kind of <laughs> direct and yet it's got all the big kind of crescendos and, and high notes and all of that in it it's a very <laughs> unbluegrassy song isn't it well I mean when you when you take a ballad like that and double time it that's just one of my favorite feels and, and I'll admit the Dolly influence on that I've been doing that ever since I first heard Silver Dagger uh, you know, mm. our band Hit and Run used to cover Silver Dagger. And then we were like, wait, why? Let's do our own. And we we decided to do it to the Bonnie Raitt tune, um, Any Day Woman. So we opened one of our Hit and Run records with that. So I've always loved that feel of a double time ballad feel. And um, <clears throat> when I heard It's Over... I remember driving along in my dad's car in Richmond and we were headed to do the sessions with Hit and Run. And I was in Richmond, Virginia. We had rented a little apartment um, near uh, the Doobie Shea Studios where we recorded. And I remember that song came on the radio. I remember exactly where I was when I heard it. And I was like, oh my God, it's so good. Like when he hits the high note, it's just so passionate and sad and intense and it's just awful you're just you're feeling 
so bad for the singer. And um, I just loved it. And I kind of always thought that maybe Hit and Run would work it out one day. But I, I, I downloaded the tune. I would listen to it every now and then. And then this time I decided to go for it. And I brought it to Bill, um, <clears throat> which is kind of funny because I had so much original material that we could have done instead. But I just really wanted to hear that Ron Block groove on it hmm. with, you know. Yeah, yeah. And um, so my favorite moment in that arrangement is this was Bill's idea. Um, we did a little modulation um, in the middle there. Mm. And it is so beautiful the way it, it was Bill's idea, how we came out of the modulation. It just, it, it felt like a movie score to me. Just, it feels so painful and beautiful at the same time. So poignant and intense. Um, and then I feel like Stuart Duncan and Josh Swift, I mean, they just did exactly what we wanted, you know? just the intensity of the beauty of the melody lines they played there. Mm. Yeah, it's brilliant. And that, to the other track that you're saying you had more than enough original material, but it also co comes back to what you were saying before about kind of taking the pop grooves. And the other cover, obviously, is Borderline, which is just like, it's a funny one because I know it. I've known it for a long time. It's one of something everybody knows, but I didn't, I hadn't sort of, until it's, stripped down a bit into a sim like a, a, an arrangement that's got more clarity because it's acoustic what's well, a strange old song isn't it it's a it's a really weird song right. the chords are like it's, it only, not what you would normally play it, like it tries to not give you a chorus almost which is really <laughs> unusual for a pop song <laughs> yeah yeah i just love i fell in love with the chords i was i don't know why i think i was listening to a lot of 80s music at the time and that and i Every now and then I'll pop on Madonna. I, I still sing along with a lot of her old songs in the car. The kids love to make fun of me for that. Um, but when I realized the beauty of the chord progression of that pre-chorus, <clears throat> and then it goes into the chorus, which has a whole other set of cool, you know, cool, you know, I just, I just like played it at home myself learn the chords and I was like are you a Love Cannon fan? Have you ever heard them? No, no. The band okay, so the band Love Cannon is in Charlottesville, Virginia they've recorded three albums and those albums are 80s hits done with bluegrass instrumentation um, but they're extremely talented musicians, they could do anything you know, they all, you know, they play other styles besides bluegrass and that shows but they, they do these off the hook of good arrangements of 80s um, hits. And I contacted them and asked if they would play Borderline with me and didn't get a response. They must have been busy. So I'm, I, I kind of like, I bugged them about it several times. And then finally, like, okay, we can do it. And I drove all the way to Charlottesville, Virginia for the one track, um, set it up and, um, and I had this idea that we could jam into an instrumental. And once I had that idea, I sat down and literally, and this is rare for me, just something popped into my head. Just, this happened with Canty Reel as well. Both of them, um, both of those melodies came into my head first. And then I put them on guitar. And for me, that's, that's going to be the best guitar melody because it's not going to sound like licks. It's not going to sound like habits. It's not going to sound mm. contrived. It's something that, you know, is a real melody that my head somehow heard, um, translate it to guitar. And that happened with borderline pretty much in like five minutes, which was weird. And I recorded it on my iPhone and sent it to the guys on before I showed up for the session. And I was like, what do you think of this? Could we work this in, in the middle there? And, so in the middle, Borderline became a seven and a half minute track. And it's partially because I stuck in that in instrumental section there, which I, I can't, um, <clears throat> I guess I'll just call it Borderline Real, but on the track, it's just called Borderline. Has my, um, you know, AABB -B of my reel in the middle. 
And Adam Larrabee, who is the banjo player for Love Cannon, is an extremely talented arranger. Um, he teaches, you know, college level music, teaches jazz on the banjo as well. He plays jazz guitar. Um, what was fun for me was to show up and be a part of their team just for a night. Like they sit around a round table. It was such a thrill to see how they hash things out and everybody was adding their thoughts. But Adam was the clear captain of the ship and he was kind of running things and very, um, you know, everybody respected him so much. It was just, it was a neat thing to see and to be part of for an evening. Um, and then Adam went home and created this like long studio chart with, with on standard notation, not just a Nashville number system chart, which we all do here in Nashville. And he emailed it to everyone that night within a couple hours, along with a voice memo of the rehearsal. And then we all showed up the next morning and, and uh, played it. Wow. Yeah, it was cool. I remember sort of looking at the tracks when I first got them and looking at Borderline, and like it didn't occur to me necessarily it would be that song. And I started listening, I was like, "Oh, is that?" And then looking, going, "This is nearly eight minutes long. What's going on here? Like, what what have they done to it?" It's like, <laughs> and it's it's brilliant because it's it does it does exactly what a good cover should do is that it lets you see a really familiar song from a totally different angle, and it kind of just like shines a light on it in a different in a different way. Um, and I think this. There was so much like 20 years ago after Oh Brother of people just doing pop songs in a bluegrass style as like a cash in bandwagon jumping thing. And they're really boring. Like, but when you take a song and actually <laughs> do something new with it and stretch it out and play around with it and see where it can go, it's amazing. Well, I appreciate that. And I thought Stuart added a lot to it too. Stuart Duncan, he added fiddle. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the one that was selected by Brad Paul, uh, my radio promoter to be his Americana radio single and, and by Carrie Estrin, my folk <clears throat> radio promoter. So that said something to me. I was interested that <clears throat> both people independently of each other chose that as their radio single. Both of them asked, can there be a radio edit? Mm-hmm. Cause we can't send a seven and a half minute song to radio. So they were like, there can be a radio edit. And um, Adam, the banjo player suggested, you know, why don't you trail off as the reel is going? So people feel like they're about to miss something. It's kind of like that. So that's how the radio edit fades down. Cool. Yeah. It's great. And you took, you mentioned um, Canty Reel, which is sort of the, the instrumental track on the record, which I love. It's got such a, it doesn't sound anything like it, but it reminds me. Do you know um, a tune of Ross Barenberg's called Magic Foot? No, I'm a huge... Which, which record? I'm a huge fan of Ross Barenberg. Oh, is it on? Which one's it on? I can't remember which record it's on. It's such a good track. And it's. I think that's also... It's in A, right? Canty Reel. Um, 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 on the record, it's in B, but we've been playing it live in A. <laughs> okay. It's got. It's just got a feel of it somehow. Um, and I don't know. It's not It's not the same sort of tune. There's something about it that reminded me of it, and that's one of my favourite tunes. Um, and it's so, so melodic. But as you say, it's got that constantly shifting under you, like when you think you know how it's going to go. Right. Slightly goes, slightly goes another way and just pulls you with it. And it's, I love the guitar solo on that. There's, there's something on that, but there's also, it reminded me, there's something that you do with intervals on a guitar that instead of just playing a bunch of licks, you, you'll play some fairly wide intervals or move things around texturally a bit. And it happens on one of the songs on When We Fall. I can't remember which one. There's a, there's a solo that's got a similar kind of thing on. And I just love it because there's, I'm, you're so used to hearing bluegrass guitar do a certain thing. And there's moments when you do bits of that as well. But then there's just these points where it's something that I, my ears not not expecting to come next. And it drags you across something, or and there's that there's just a, a kind of wide open texture thing suddenly goes on, and it was just it was a, a glorious moment first time I heard that. You know, I, I appreciate you saying that. Um, this is a habit I've gotten into since uh, Kenny Smith produced. Are you familiar with Kenny Smith, the guitar mm. player? He produced. He and his wife Amanda produced a hit and run record back in two thousand four, and I went in to do a solo. Um, overdub in the studio and 
he was like, mm, no, it's like, you need to go out, work on that, come up with something I've never heard before. Mm. And that's the difference between bluegrass jamming and bluegrass improv and actually creating, composing bluegrass guitar solos for a record. Um, some might argue with me, oh, no, that's not spontaneous. But um, I I see, and because then I went and worked on it, went back to him. Kenny said, no, come back again. And it, it just took hours of me trying things. He's like, that's not interesting enough. I don't care enough when I hear that. And it's just the attention of we were talking about that, you know, it needs to be about half what you would expect because it needs to sound like bluegrass guitar, Hmm. but it needs to be inventive and creative enough that you care because otherwise it's going to feel like elevator music. I mean, you've heard all those licks before. And so I I think it's what you just said. I I appreciate because in, in the Tony Rice book still inside um, it also um, Tim Stafford wrote that, um, he wrote that Tony said that he spends spent time composing his solos beforehand as well. And, and I teach a bunch of Tony Rice solos online. So I've been going through them and, and telling people it's obvious he composed this ahead of time because he'll play you know, certain ideas that, you know, you would be, you just wouldn't come up with them on the fly. You know, it's like, it's so fast and so technical. Um, and then some of those ideas became part of his language that he could improvise with them later. But um, I'm, this is a long-winded response to, to what you just said. But my point being, um, I appreciate that. And a lot of those I did put some thought into where it wouldn't be the same old stuff. I would normally maybe just jam. Like, hey, let's jam on Canty Reel. And maybe mm-hmm. I'd play things that, you know, just kind of float out. Maybe some more habits. Maybe... Um, you know, it's just nice to sit down if you're going to record and just kind of be 10% better than you would improvise or maybe, maybe more than 10%, you know, just come up with something really artistic that you'd want to hear over and over, you know? Yeah. And it's really interesting you say that about Tony Rice because his solos are full of moments. He has a vocabulary, like you say, and you can often hear him use the same licks in different ways or kind of start them on a different beat or twist them slightly but you will do things like stick in a chord substitution or just a ridiculous bend at a point where you're not expecting one in ways that other people don't and i love stuff like that they just sort of it'll start solo with this i think is it um i waited as long as i can the they solo on that it just starts with this huge like bend just to grab your ear and they go right and now we're off you know and i love solos that don't just there's so much wonderful bluegrass playing that does what you expect it to and sounds great and there's so many records with that out there and you hear people do it live and i love all of that but i love something that just surprises you as well right and and it still needs to sound like bluegrass guitar that's the key um a lot of people what is bluegrass guitar it's it's a language it's it's a genre um and it's it's Jazz is the same thing. If you just sit down and play only Charlie Parker licks, it's going to sound not creative. That's more like a skill, right? Bluegrass guitar can be compared to a skill. So when does it become an art? You know, when you have your own voice in it. And that's, I'd say, for me, that's the goal. I, I don't want to sound like a Tony Rice clone. And like if if somebody says I sound like Tony Rice, I, which I've heard some people say before, um, it's not necessarily like my goal, or I wouldn't necessarily be so excited, even though it's a compliment too, right? But I know our tone is totally different. I'm not saying I'm not comparing myself to Tony Rice by any means. I'm just trying to say that I think there's a higher value in, you know learning from these masters and then if you sound like them maybe some of what they do or some of their spirit is flowing into what you do but you're ultimately hearing ideas coming from your head and i actually (laughs) i played some um guitar early on i was playing some guitar 
um, that I'd come up with my own arrangement for. And someone said to me, well, where'd you get that lick? And I said, like, in my head. And they were like, no, really, but where'd you get the lick? And I was like, I'm serious. I heard it in my head. And, and the person like couldn't grasp because they, they only learn licks from other licks. Mm. Right. And yeah. so tuning in how, how, I'd say I spend a lot of time trying to get into the space where my, you know, my intuition is providing the musical um, language. I don't even know if that makes sense to anyone but me, but. <laughs> no, totally. I think uh, you put like it's, you put all this stuff in, whether it's external stuff or working out your own things or whatever. And then it's a bit like having a conversation with somebody, like all the things you've read, like the example you get before about Dickens and Scrooge was the one that came out because you read that and you go, well, uh, this is the thing. But most of what we say in conversations is standard words and phrases that everybody would use. They're like conversational licks almost. But right. nobody talks entirely in those. We don't all talk in cliches all the time. We have original thoughts that occur to us as we're going along. And that's what makes us who we are. And that's our style. And I think music is... It's funny, you mentioned Dolly Parton before, but I read something the other day and I put out a very short episode of the podcast based on just this idea. But I saw a quote of Dolly's, it's been around for ages, but I'd never seen, which was find out who you are and do it on purpose. Like this idea that that we, you, we're all, it's easy to look at the people and go, I should be like that. But the idea is we all, as you say, have our own voice. And when you find out what that is and really lean into it, that's the interesting stuff, really. Right. That's a really good point. Find out who, who you are and do it on purpose. Yes. Find out what makes you tick and flow. Right. That's kind of, that's the key. That was the key for me when I figured out it was flat picking guitar. Cause that I was like, this is so challenging. And it's, it's like, I can't even believe I think I'm ever going to do it. I kind of came late to flat picking compared to a lot of these, you know, genius kids who do it. Um, I was in college before I even got obsessed with it. So I remember going to Winfield and I could only play like a couple of tunes and very slowly. Right. And probably very poorly. And um, I remember somebody was like, so, you know, what do you want to do in life? Or like, what do you would, you know, think it because I was at University of Michigan and like, what are you majoring in? What do you want to do? I was like, I want to be a flat picker. And they were like, hmm. <laughs> like in my head, I'd already decided mm -hmm. this is what I am. Even though I can't really do it yet, I'm just going to do it. And um, it it is exciting to find something that you think you might still love to do when you're old, you know. And I'm old now and I still love it. <laughs> yeah, I used to know, so when I was a kid, before I'd even ever played an instrument, I was convinced I was going to be a drummer in a band for a living when I grew up. And I'm not. Like, you know, I am twice a year for like a day. That's what I do. But like, and it, but it sort of doesn't matter. It's like just you get an idea in your head of right. your thing and maybe that ends up being your thing. Weirdly, podcasting turns out to be my thing, which didn't even exist when I was a kid. But um, yeah, I love how we sort of, you just find a thing that speaks to you in some form. And you follow it. and Right. Yeah. Um, I love what you said in there about flat picking. See, I, it's easy to think of flat picking as being a style of guitar playing, but you described it as a language. And I like that. It's more about a kind of collection of ideas than necessarily the technique. Because so many people play guitar with a flat pick, but aren't flat picking. Right. And I love the idea that it's the thinking of it as a language rather than a specific technique. Right. It does have its own technique. Um, but it, it, it is a certain, um, you're right. It's a style. It's a style. Um, it's a skill, a style and a language. And there's, there's certain, there's certain combinations of when I try to explain it, it's difficult to people who don't know their music theory yet, but if someone does i'm like there's a rainbow between the major scale all the way over to the minor pentatonic or the minor you know pentatonic with the flat five the blue scale and somehow bluegrass guitar we use the entire rainbow in one solo and it sounds cohesive like it was meant to be 
we can go from mm. flat five bluesy to the very next phrase having, you know, ha- having that major seven of the major scale and the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of the major scale. And it sounds like a minuet, you know, and then the very next phrase can sound like it belonged in Memphis in a blues band. Um, we combine all of that in one solo and, and I'll show them, I'll play a Tony Rice solo for them and I'll be like, does that sound weird? And he's playing a minor pentatonic scale with a flat five over a very major song with a very cute church-like melody. Like, how is this working? And so that's really special. Of course, I mean, in rock music, I guess you could say the same, but since I concentrate so much on flat picking, I've broken it down so many times for students. Um, and I've found that that flat three to um, major three, um, the flat seven, putting in the flat seven quite a bit. Of course, I've probably just thought about this way too much because I have taught a lot in the past 10 years, Um, but I've just broken it down and realized how fascinating it is. And this is why I'm so passionate about teaching guitar solos online because I love going through bit by bit and being like, look at the use of this six here. It's so cool. (laughs) And I just get excited about it. Um, But, you know, the language um, was originally, um, well, Mother Maybell. And then when, when Doc Watson started using those fast eighth notes, um, that became part of the expressiveness of like the, in, you know, the impressive right hand, just picking like typewriter bullet, you know, just like perfectly in time, eighth notes with that, um, the right hand flat picking. Um, and then, you know, with each progression of each player who added to the language with Clarence and then Tony, and then, and then we've had this amazing group in the past, you know, couple decades, um, you, if you sit down at a jam, you'll hear somebody who might have been more more influenced by Kenny Smith, and you know more influenced by. And, it, and it's so fascinating to me, even within flat picking, which is a small niche. Hmm. There's styles within that, you know. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. It's fascinating, and I'm I'm still kind of, I guess, relatively new to it. I'm still finding all these kind of corners and things, and going, you know, oh, this sounds great. And then you hear David Greer, and you go, oh, hello. Right. Okay, there's that. All right, let's kind of look at let's kind of look at that. <laughs> he's in whole. He's an entire orchestra with one person. It's amazing. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, so, Boarding Windows in Paradise is coming out in September. Yes. What have you got plans to tour? Where can people come and see you with this record? What's what have you got going on? We have. Um, Tour dates, we're kicking things off in Colorado for the Four Corners Folk Festival over Labor Day. And then um, got stationed in for the album release party on September 10th in Nashville. Um, and of course, um, so some radio appearances. Um, but then I've got, um, we have East Coast, actually a lot of Eastern Seaboard um, happening. We have multiple Maryland dates, Virginia um, North Carolina, West Virginia, South Carolina, Georgia. Um, and then ending things up, actually, I'll be doing a solo performance at Country Music Hall of Fame oh, cool. uh, right before Thanksgiving. So got a nice, um, nice album release tour. I'm excited about it. Yeah, well, I'll put a link in the show notes so people can go and check out the tour dates, make sure people can see where you're playing. Um, but I just best of luck with the record. I absolutely love it. I think it's fantastic. Um, Thank I, you. Like it's it's this, it's exciting getting to hear a record before the rest of the world does. Um, but it's all the more exciting when you can't wait for the rest of them to hear it. It's just I've loved it. It's and it's going to be on my playlist for quite some time. I think. Thank you very much. That means a lot. No, it's been really cool talking to you about it. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. I've enjoyed it too. Thank you. Bluegrass Jamalong is proud to be sponsored by Collings Guitars and Mandolins, making some of the finest guitars and mandolins in the world since the 1970s. Visit collingsguitars.com and find out why.